Hello, welcome to Science and Curiosity. Today is January 12th of 2014. Hope I don't forget to say 2014. I'm going to keep saying 2014, so I won't forget to say 2014. Uh, today I have a really great guest, someone who has really come down from the mountain to be on my show today. I really appreciate it. We have Dr. Pamela Gay. She's a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and director of CosmoQuest and one of my favorite podcasts she co-hosts uh, with Fraser Kane, uh, Astronomy Cast. Uh, thank you for being with me today. It, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, please, really. You're the <laughs> definitely much better have you on my show. Uh, <laughs> Now, what we're going to be talking about here in a little bit uh, is science and religion, whether they overlap, if there is any overlap, and uh, some of the issues that people, uh, like myself, I, I identify as an atheist, I'm in the skeptical community, and I see a lot of the, uh, really, abuse that can be heaped onto people who identify as religious in those communities. Uh, but really, before we get into it, since uh, last week I didn't have my voice, it ran away, I, unfortunately I caught it before I got married in Vegas, uh, I did want to ask... Uh, were there any really big science stories from last year that you thought were really great that maybe didn't get uh, really popularized too well or anything that you'd um, like to talk about? You know, was last trouble? year was kind of the year of planetary science. We had Mars Curiosity rover safely land on Mars. We've verified every possible way that there is water on Mars short of having liquid run across the wheels of one of the rovers. Yeah. Geysers were found on Europa, or at least ice volcanoes of some sort. Uh, every world we looked at, we made new discoveries. And now it's just a matter of getting out there even further, hopefully with people, more probes. But it was also the year that NASA's budget took a almighty hit, and the year that many of us in the fields of astronomy and space science just started to wonder how much longer we can make it before we lose our jobs. So it was a year of amazing discovery while at the same time watching many of our colleagues move on to finance, computer science, the stock market, fields that pay so much better but don't let them follow their dreams. Yeah, that's one of the things I've always been concerned about is it seems like there are a lot of people who enter the sciences uh, really deeply, passionately interested in it, but because you really can't make a living in those fields now, they end up going to business or they end up going to yeah. a field that they can make money on. Yeah, it's, it's one of those very frustrating things where I look at the entire structure of where we're spending money and I see all sorts of money going into getting kids to feel passion about physics and astronomy and all of the sciences and encouraging careers in science. And I've written so many grants that require me to detail how what I'm doing contributes to the pipeline of people choosing careers in science, choosing education in science. And then that day you graduate with your PhD, you realize, I can't do this. There's no jobs. And it's extremely bittersweet. And I have to admit, I'm at the point where I only take on computer science students right now because I know a computer science student always has a job. Right. And, and that's uh, a shame for two reasons. One, uh, obviously our future depends on uh, not just the public education science of people being able to understand how science plays into our everyday life, but also into uh, just making sure that we can keep up with the other countries if you want to look right. at it as an international competition. Yeah, it, one of the truly frustrating things that, that I've started to perceive as I travel for my job, I, I do a lot of work to try and use astronomy in the developing world to get people to want to learn the science, technology, and engineering classes, not to become astronomers, but to help develop their nation into being part of our technological future. And astronomy is a great way to get people hooked on wanting to learn, even if you don't get them hooked on going into astronomy. And what I see as I travel is kids all around the world, but not here at home, are learning that if I learn computers, I can improve my family, I can improve my country. If I learn science, I can improve my family, I can improve my country. And so families are pushing their kids and kids are pushing themselves because they see learning as a way of guaranteeing a bright future. 
But I don't see kids here in America feeling that a solid education is the way to guarantee their future. And and I've seen it in my own family where some of my cousins have been like, why why don't you just get a union job like the rest of us and earn real money? And and it's true. They they earn better incomes than I do. But it says something that education isn't the way to a bright future here in America. And I'm I'm not sure where that changed because you look back at the happy days, the Waltons, the old TV shows that you think at least mirrored some small part of the American culture. And they all push education. Somewhere we lost that. Well, my, uh, I would imagine it has something to do with the sheer cost of going and getting a higher education these days. Yes, that's, that's entirely true. And not knowing if your education is actually going to benefit you because while there are careers that require university degrees, a lot of people are getting degrees that leave them with $100,000 in debt and they don't actually see a pay increase for it. A lot of people who get degrees in the humanities and the social sciences, the the boost in income you get isn't equivalent to the debt that you get. And that's very hard. And so we need to really consider why is education in America so expensive? Why is it that it's not as expensive in other nations where they're so much better at subsidizing the cost of education? And part of what we're seeing when we look at this is a a combination of just trying to put too many people through the university system and the infrastructure you have to build is is extraordinarily expensive where we're trying to get too many students who aren't necessarily well prepared to get university degrees mm. that just drives up the cost for everybody and we also have fairly low tax rates here in the US and I don't think I should probably go into that one in too much detail because <laughs> that just hurts okay now uh, what I the reason why I asked you to be on the show or would wanted you to be on the show is uh, as I mentioned I, I'm not any kind of uh, I don't play a big role in it, but I do get involved in the skeptic community. I do get involved in skeptical discussions. And right. uh, I myself, I'm not bl- bragging, I'm just explaining my own background. I uh, do uh, currently uh, help with uh, maintaining two different, uh, really atheist groups. One's a humanist, one's a free thinker, but uh, for all manners and purposes, they're atheist groups. And I've noticed uh, that there is a big... Uh, just big deal against people who are scientists and religious in any sense of the word. Yeah. Uh, and I know that uh, a lot of people will tend to stay out of this. You have uh, Neil Tyson, who really refuses to address it. Carl Sagan didn't much in his lifetime. Uh, others really don't want to wade into it. it they, some who are obviously atheist or Christian, but refuse to really address it. Now, you have brought it up before, and, I, and uh, obviously I know... I mean, you are you identify as Christian, but you're not a creationist. You uh, are not a presuppositionalist, like what we see a lot here. Uh, so I wanted you to kind of explain your views on this, and then kind of continue the discussion from there. At, at a certain level, we all have to make choices in what we choose to believe and not to believe. And when it comes to making a choice of do I choose to accept the notion that our universe could have a higher power, a uh, entity outside of our day-to-day reality? There's no evidence in either direction. And at least nothing I can test as a scientist in the lab. There's statistical improbabilities, there's coincidences, but none of it is testable. And... I've chosen at the end of the day to make the choice to believe in a higher power, to want to believe in the basic concepts behind Christianity as it's taught in the Bible, not necessarily as it's taught in the church. Um, Going out and dealing with sinners is not something I have a problem with. I have no issues with wine. And uh, as one of my friends who's a pastor once said to me, if Jesus was alive today, he'd be hanging out with the gays and well, being honest, but not worrying about who was around him. Um, But I understand that it's a choice I made and I could be wrong. And we each have to make our own choices and we each have to be critical and open to discussion. But I don't think we need 
the hate and the vitriol that's out there. I have gotten hate mail telling me that clearly the reason my publication record isn't better is because I made the mistake in believing in God. And I just don't understand why some people think that life requires them to show so much hate. If you don't believe in a God, then life is particularly short. So why are you using the days that you have to hate? I, I don't get that, but I know it's part of reality. And, and I would actually point out that Neil deGrasse Tyson has come out on the side of atheism in his talks at TAM that you can find on the internet. Um, and Sean Carroll and many other scientists have done that. Um, but there's also scientists out there who've come out as being Christian. Don York, who was the leader behind the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, has appeared on television talking about his Christianity. And so there are great scientists out there who simply choose to focus on just doing their science rather than getting engaged in the religion and skepticism debate. And I think it's just a matter that the Christians at this point just want to get their work done instead of fighting. Fighting, there's no reason for it. We should all be working to create a more educated society. We should all be working to teach critical thinking and forget the hate. Yeah, personally, I'm someone who uh, I much care or much more care that someone's understanding of science, their ability to think rationally is uh, actually there, that they're able to think, that they're able to process information and make reasonable decisions. I might not always agree with those decisions they make or conclusions they make, but as long as they can make them with some reasons behind them, uh, that's really all I care about. Uh, now, I, I did find it interesting you said that you chose to believe. Um, myself, I found that as I got, uh, as I learn more, as I read more, I don't really find the ability to uh, make myself to believe something or to try to believe something. I end up uh, really kind of getting to a point where I really can't believe this anymore. Uh, and I've noticed this quite often with people I've spoken with who are in the skeptic or atheist community that they do say that they reached a point where they cannot make themselves believe, even though many of them tried to. Uh, I, I can't speak for someone else's right, right. thinking. I know for me, there, there are days where I look at so many of the awful things that happen in this world that have no explanation. And I can only hope that there is something beyond this experience when I see the starvation, when I see the wars, when I see cases in Rwanda where they simply went through and cut off the arms of all the able-bodied men. I realize that there's a lot of horror to humanity and I can only hope that maybe there's something outside of all of this. It's a hope, it's a choice, it's a decision, okay. recognizing the ugliness that's out there. Okay. And, uh, now, for me, I, I would have a problem, and I'm, I'm not trying to tag just a uh, just discussion. Know. But it would be a problem for me that I, to imagine that there is a being of some intellect, of some ability of self-action that would just sit by and allow this to happen. Um, so I guess in my mind, sorry, I have a phone that's apparently still turned on. Um, the God of the Bible is not necessarily a kind one. Yeah. And humans were granted free will. And just as many parents have had the misfortune of realizing that their drug addicted child, their mentally ill child, this child they want to love and protect and cherish and raise to do good, it's beyond their ability to rein in that child and that child is going to self-harm themselves. And sometimes you just have to let go and hope that your child comes back and hope that your child asks for the help they need. We have free will. And that means that terrible things are going to happen because of that free will. And it is what it is. We each make choices though. And in the face of not having 
a, a conclusion, a logical, testable reality. Um, there's so many things in science that you look at and you realize what's not ruled out. Multiverses aren't ruled out. For all we know, we're an experiment in a giant petri dish of multiverses where greater dimensional beings are brewing us up like bacteria. We don't know what's beyond our existence. And whether you choose to call that God, God's a laboratory experiment gone horribly wrong for humanity, um, we don't know. We can't know. And it may be this is all we have. This universe is all that there is. There's nothing beyond this. And we make our choice on the lack of evidence to decide what gives us peace at night. What yeah. if we're wrong, we're willing to be wrong about. And that that's the other side of it is I have a choice to either be wrong and there is a God and I chose to be atheist or to be wrong in believing and trying to find peace in that. And, and I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a choice. Which way do you want to be wrong? And I've chosen, well, if I'm going to be wrong and there actually is a go God, at least I've done no harm. And it's my choice. Okay. That, well, that's at, uh, to get to the last part there, uh, there are some other things I did want to discuss real quick. But that last part sounded like an, uh, uh, the uh, Pascal's wager a little bit reworked. Uh, and, and many people don't really find that to be satisfying. I mean, by what you mean, you, you say to believe in God, at least you believe in God. Uh, if he does exist, well, then you do run into, well, what if the real God is Allah? What if the real God is Vishnu or Krishna, one of the many ones that have been forgotten, or any of these other uh, various types of God that have come and gone? Then I'm wrong. Yeah. Like I said, we all have to make a choice, right. and this is the choice I've chosen to make. And I'm willing to debate belief systems in, in not necessarily this public a forum. Right. Well, um, I'm not intending it as just to yeah. kind of explore. But there's nothing in science that's inconsistent with the possibility of a greater power. And there's nothing in religion if you're willing to accept that a god wouldn't have explained the quantum mechanical origins of the universe to people who didn't have the concept of zero, and the Bible makes a really good parable. If you're willing to find that middle line, then there's nothing in religion that denies the ability of science to explain our universe. And it would be an awful weak god who couldn't create a physically consistent system for us to exist within. Uh I'm going to step back a bit. Uh, you were talking about free will, about how uh, God gave us free will and that allows for certain actions which can harm other people. Now, uh, it doesn't take much of a stretch to go, well, what about people with autism? What about people who have uh, mental syndromes that make them more prone to violence, that make them more prone to cause harm to other people? Uh, those people who have been raised in uh, either harmful households or uh, something has been done to them in the past? Which isn't always what drives bad actions. You know, it's much more. Mm -hmm. It's not always nature versus nurture. It's usually a combination of the two. Um, but where you get this, where it's not really the person's decision which led them to these bad actions. It's this history of whatever came before, or their genetics, which led them to be to cause harm. When one of my dear friends, who is a strong Christian woman work to raise her kids right, one of her daughters is schizophrenic, and the state had to take her away to protect the mother who landed in the hospital. Mm -hmm. These things happen. And this is where you look at why, in a system of free will, can't you accept that genetics is part of free will? If, if you allow science, if you allow a universe that started from the Big Bang, continued on through natural scientific processes, planet formed via standard method of planet formation, which we don't yet fully understand, <laughs> life evolved, and it evolved flawed, and it evolved capable of free will. All of these flaws were built into the system as part of what led to humans existing. 
And free will has consequences. Evolution has consequences. And some of those consequences include uh, the, the, I don't know what language I can use on your show, so insert naughty word here, that gets used to describe the people who create massacres, who shoot up high schools, who beat up their parents. But the, the, the problem I have is then you end up with this uh, Christianity, when you get down to the base of it, uh, does blame humanity for their sins. It, it is saying that you are wrong, you, are, you have been created flawed, and by the grace of this God who created you in the first place, uh, and from, your pers from what you said there, uh, led to these laws which came into place uh, of evolution, uh, making the person themselves flawed, and then you are blamed for that until you go to God and ask for forgiveness. That, that, that's what it's sounding like at the moment. And I'm not sure where your problem with the idea that free will and flaws are intertwined. That's a classic philosoph philosophical idea that when people act beyond their ability to understand the outcomes or act beyond caring about the outcomes, that's where evil, sin, choose the words you want, is introduced into society. Well, no, what I mean is, is you're saying that uh, God has set this in motion and then uh, due to things beyond your control, you're blamed for things. Or maybe I'm, what, I'm misstating what I'm trying to what say. What I'm stating is mm -hmm. the nature of free will, the nature mm -hmm. of people to make decisions, to have a, a view of the world where they take in information and act on it, whether logically or not. The act of having free will, the act of being able to choose our own actions, gives us the freedom to do horrible things. Mm -hmm. And that's the nature of free will. And I don't see how you could have free will without having horrible things happen. Well, the Christian concept of heaven is that you still have free will, but nothing bad happens there. Um, that's a, a actually various, not uh, described various. anywhere in the Bible. Well, the, the that's, own, that's something that, that is uh, very much a church doctrine. And, right. and doesn't right. come from, from any uh, actual word of Jesus. He simply says, there, there's a place in the house of my father. Yeah, you're uh, right. I apologize. I, I take that back. Uh, so uh, to kind of continue on. So there is a uh, statement that people who cling to God are weak-minded. It sounds like what you're, you've said earlier, that uh, you're fully willing on being wrong. There's no weak-mindedness involved there. So there, so that is one issue I've seen a lot is that people will go back to uh, saying that if you're, well, if you're a scientist, if you're a Christian, or if you're whatever you might be, if you require a God, then that's a crutch. Uh, and that, that itself is not, uh, that just shows how weak-minded you are, but it really doesn't sound like it from what you're describing. I, I think there are weak-minded people of both philosophical mindsets. There are weak-minded atheists and there are weak-minded Christians, both of whom live lives that aren't fully reflected upon, where they simply shout out, no, you're wrong, with actually, without actually being critical of why they believe what they believe, without actually being critical in the consequences of what it means to consider the other side. I have great respect for Nietzsche because of how hard he took, how hard a look he took into the consequences of there not being a God. Mm -hmm. And he embraced those consequences in making the decision to be an atheist. And I think we each need to be highly critical of what it means to have the beliefs we have and highly critical in looking at the different alternatives before we reject them. And not everybody does that. But it's not just the Christians, it's not just the Muslims, it's not just, it's not just anybody. It's people in all social groups. Some are weak, some are strong, some are critical, some simply follow whatever they're told. Mm -hmm. And there's no one party that you can point at and say uniformly that group is screwed up. You have to look at individuals and judge the individuals. And while there are times when you need to say, 
this group of leaders has led a group of weak-minded people in a terrible direction. And here I look at the people who are spouting um, young earth creationism. I'm looking at the people who are spouting that we should above all things fight against abortion, even in the case of incest and rape and the birth might kill the mother. People who lead things in a direction that can lead to great harm. It's those critical leaders that I think are the problem because every group has weak-minded followers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, to me, I, I have more of a problem with ideologies and religion. If, if you get to any kind of uh, teaching and take it to an extreme, regardless of what it is, whether it's communism, whether it's Christianity, you end up with yeah. this I ideology, which is often the way that things become uh, taken to an extreme where people are burned, where people are killed, books are censored, that kind of thing. Uh, and it was interesting what you said about Neil Tyson. I was at a talk of his here in Florida just uh, two months ago, and he was very against taking on the atheism label. So I was kind it's, of surprised. There, there is a difference between taking on the label of something in a public setting and having actions that are completely consistent. Yeah. Um, I tend to judge people more by their actions, and I, I would encourage you to go back to the 2011 TAM talk that he, get, he gave, which is available on YouTube, where his language is one of mocking people who believe in a god. And that sort of mocking is it, the actions and the language of that is, is what I would look at. Okay. So he never actually said he was an atheist? No, oh, okay. but, okay. but the actions of being mocking and embracing the laughter that came with um, the, the language that was used. And I was not there, but I heard yeah. that he used similar language in a speech last week at the American Astronomical Society meeting. Okay, because uh, I'm only saying, because when I was at the talk, and I, I'm kind of hesitant to say this without obviously him being here or anything like that. Right. But it, he actually was uh, just, a, he was insulted towards atheists. Uh, he was uh, very much in favor of making fun of them. So he, he seems to be trying to, I, I wonder at that point whether he's trying to play a crowd or not. Yeah, um, that, that is a completely different question. The only crowds that I've seen him address are uh, the crowds at the Amazing Meeting, which is very much a skeptical, largely atheist mm -hmm. meeting, and at the American Astronomical Society and the Astronomical Society with the Pacific. And in all three of those audiences, he's made comments that um, belittled the intelligence of people who believed in a God. Mm. Now, that was uh, one thing I did want to address earlier, and I want to get back to it, just uh, kind of bring this back up. Now, one thing that the scientific community faces, one thing the skeptical community has been facing, uh, has been a lot of issues with sexism. And I, I was going to bring this yeah. up earlier when we were talking about uh, the education of science. Uh, so we are backtracking quite a bit here, but I did want to get into this. Now, uh, my own view, and this is being an outsider, I've not really, uh, I've taken some college, but I've not been heavily involved in it, is that it does seem like while it is getting better, I've met many women scientists. I've not seen many who are as public figures as a lot of the male scientists that are, uh, uh, you mentioned Neil Tyson, there's Bill Nye, uh, I mean, obviously there's yourself and a few others, but it seems like there's still that divide of people who are really making an impact on getting science popularized. I mean, Eugenie Scott is probably my favorite example, but she's not a, she's not been as in big a figure as some other people have been. No, she, Eugenie Scott, uh, Jill Tarter from the SETI Institute, they oh. that, that generation of women who are now in, their mid to late 50s uh, to early to mid 60s, they, they were powerhouse women who really decided, I'm going to work hard enough to earn my place. Mm -hmm. And some of them did it with anger, some of them did it with poise, all of them did, the, did it with excellence. And when you look at their careers, what you find is they often had to be 
significantly better than the men to stay in the field. Mm -hmm. And that is still true today. What we're seeing today is the women today are facing a new resurgence in sexism that I think took all of us entirely by surprise. Women who are in their mid-20s to early 40s, we, we all grew up with the uh, women's lib. Lib is in the past. You don't need to be a feminist anymore. Wait, huh? Wait, I do need to be a feminist. Crud, they're trying to take over. And by take over, I mean push us out so there's no place for women in the dialogue. We learned that it should be okay for us to wear pants and v-neck sweaters. And then there is a, a new thing called slut shaming, mm -hmm. where if you're in the workplace and someone grabs you, touches you, or makes entirely inappropriate conversation, it's blamed on you because, well, you weren't dressed conservatively enough. But we don't have Sharia law in this nation. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's an insane situation that I, I've come to learn that anytime I post something on the internet that is highly successful, two things will happen. One is I'll start getting the, wow, she's sexy and she has a brain comment, which fine, that's actually a compliment and then people will make fun of my last name. But mm. it, it gets exhausting when you face the day-to-day -day micro inequities mm. of people expecting you to be the secretary in the department because you're a woman and it's a science department and of course you're the secretary. It gets exhausting when people are surprised that you can wear makeup and have a brain and it gets exhausting when the way people praise you isn't a handshake, isn't a high five, but it's a slap on the ass. Mm. And that's what women are dealing with and yeah. we're starting to speak out and as we start to speak out people are trying to shame us into silence and it's expensive to keep fighting i know many of us have had to hire lawyers at one point or another to make sure our careers were safe because we made the mistake of complaining that we didn't like the harassment and you shouldn't need to hire a lawyer to protect your job when you are the one being harassed. But that's the reality. Yeah. And uh, you talk about having to fight this again, and that, that is something I've noticed is when it comes to social issues, when it comes to the uh, way society uh, changes, it, we have to continue fighting the same fights. Abortion was already taken care of. Healthcare uh, should have been taken care of by now. The yeah. issues of uh, contraception has been continuously gone over. Uh, and then in the sciences too, uh, climate change is going to be a continuing debate for a long time. Uh, but uh, evolution was already settled, we thought, and now we thought. it's back on the books again of having to be debated. So there are many issues, it seems like, and this is something I try to get involved with uh, people my age, is that uh, I've noticed people have a habit of making things about one fight. You fight this fight and you win. Uh, a good example would be the... Um, uh, internet uh, laws that were going to be put in place some years back, uh, the uh, CISPA and PIPA and these other ones. Yeah. Big, massive turnout of making sure that these were struck down, and it's happened again and again and again. And the idea is eventually, in politics, they'll just wear you down. Eventually, you don't show up to vote. Uh, but Well, it, people eventually learn that it's easier. I, what they've been trying to do is pick up the frog and dump it into the boiling water. Yeah. What they're trying now is to simply turn up the temperature and the frog won't notice until he's dead. Right. And that's, that's what we're seeing is if they can't pass the sweeping reforms, well, let's just take away this. Let's just take away a few weeks. Let's mm. just take away um, this aspect in the classroom. And teach and, both sides. Right. Yeah. Teach the non-existent controversy. Right. And that, that is something that I've noticed people, and, and it's a very clever way of making it so that it seems like you're being uh, willing to have a compromise. But the problem is, is when you have a compromise between a good position and a bad position, you end up with a worse position at each time. And if you continue making those compromises, then you end up with a situation uh, much different than what we should have. Well, and there are things where there simply 
aren't two sides. Right. right. If if you want to study science, you need to make sure that you're following things that are based in evidence, based in tests that can be repeated and geology works on more than one planet. Mm -hmm. If you want to teach the socio-religious aspects of religious texts, that's what theology classrooms, in some cases, that's what English classrooms or history classrooms are from, are for. I had an excellent education in Massachusetts where uh, our English class included looking at the play, the great JB, and then looking at the book of Job. And our history class had us reading passages from every major religion in the world to compare where certain basic ideas come into society from so many different sides. There's interesting ways to raise an educated child who has an understanding of, of philosophy, of religion, and of science. And we need to get back to having those Renaissance individuals. Definitely. Now, uh, I do have a couple of viewer questions here. The first is, uh, why could teaching young earth creationism cause harm? The, the issue with teaching young earth creationism is, that, first of all, it's not science. Young Earth creationism uh, is based on the idea that the number of uh, generations in the Bible, which is inconsistent depending on whether you follow it through the men or the women's line and which, which chapters you choose, whether you look at the apocryphal, it's based on a lot of hand-waving and a literal translation of the world being created in seven days. Well, we have completely consistent theories from physics, from geophysics, from astrophysics, from quantum mechanics, all the way through modern evolutionary biology and geology and plate tectonics that places us on a planet that is between five and six billion years old in a universe that's 13.8 billion years old with multiple lines of consistent evidence. When a child grows up, being taught that the world is 6,000 years old, they start rejecting science because clearly this person is wrong. And they're faced with a choice. They either have to decide to throw out the notion that the earth is young, which in many cases causes them to question everything they've ever believed. And you find people who, in, in one case, I remember speaking with an adult young earth creationist who knew all the evidence for the Big Bang, knew all the evidence for an old universe, but couldn't give up the young earth because then he felt he'd have to give up God. And that was giving up a piece of his identity. And the struggle that he went through made me feel like this man having learned young earth creationism was actually an abuse because of what would be required, the psychological damage that would be required to undo the brainwashing he received that God and young earth creationism are one and that you can't give up one without the other. And you're, it, it, it hurts when I meet these people who have so much of their personality, so much of their self-identity invested in something that was made up by people who didn't have evidence of plate tectonics yet. There's no reason to abuse someone with false science. And uh, this is kind of my own personal question real quick. Uh, I noticed that creationism kind of popped up in the 1800s. You also have the uh, literal interpretation of Plato's uh, Atlantis and many other things that at that point, up to that point, have been taken as myths. Do you have any yeah. idea what that might be? I that's out of my field. It's interesting when I, I love digging into this stuff and reading it. I don't have the background to address why it is, but there have definitely been waves of uh, desperation to believe in false ideas. Mm -hmm. There was the wave of people wanting to go back to the idea of Apollo. There were waves of people wanting to think that the earth is flat. Uh, the ancient Greeks knew we lived on a round world. Mm -hmm. 
but yet we claim Columbus proved the earth is a, a sphere. Um, it's the cycles of history. I can't explain why it is. I, that's not my field. I just thought maybe you might have an idea. I, I just find it interesting. You can go back and uh, Ignatius Donnelly and Emmanuel Blavatsky, or Emmanuel Velikovsky and then Madame Blavatsky, uh, how they all kind of came out at that same time with a similar idea. But uh, then the next one, uh, this is another view of comment or a question. Uh, and this is something that I, I think it would be good to answer is that why do you think it is people go through higher education, they come out less religious if not atheistic, uh, and especially the further you go through the education system? I think it's a filter effect, mm -hmm. not a change effect as mm -hmm. much. One of the things that I experienced and many other Christians have experienced is abuse from faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been throughout recent decades uh, sects of the Christian church here in America and sects of the Muslim church and other nations that have attacked scientists because their scientific ideas are perceived as a threat to the church. And people who are torn between the church and science often grow silent. People who aren't torn because they're just flat out atheist will then often become abusive towards Christians or Muslims or whatever religion it is that's hurt them. And I've seen many people leave the sciences because it was easier the, to leave the sciences than to have faculty members, as I had happened to me, tell you that there's clearly something wrong with your ability to think if you believe in a God. You hear that enough times, you either stop mentioning that you're a theist, extending the perception that most scientists are atheists, you just stop mentioning it, so people assume. Or you leave the field altogether because you're tired of the abuse. It's, it's another side that people don't think about. That's unfortunate. We're probably losing a lot of good people who can do good science. Yeah, uh, I, I suspect it, that we are. I, I know in astronomy there is a small group of people who uh, meet at major astronomy meetings. It's, it's Christians in astronomy, and we're always behind a door when we meet. Well, we're getting to the end of the program. Is there anything that, uh, that I've said or anything that you'd like to expound on real quick? I, I think the biggest thing that I can say is science teaches us how amazing our universe is. And when you look at most religious documents, they expound on there being a great God who created or set the conditions for the creation of a magnificent universe. And we live in a magnificent universe. And the most amazing part is science allows us to understand it. Mm -hmm. And there are many scientists out there, many of whom are so nosed the grindstone doing science, who realize that it's in doing science that we're able to understand just how great and detailed a universe we live in and how beautifully consistent all of the sciences are in describing how we went to a big bang, to evolving in, to intellectual beings able to figure out that F equals MA. Well, very good. Uh, now, aside from what we talked about earlier in terms of the things that you do, is there anything you'd like to plug here at the end? <laughs> I, I'd like to encourage everyone to get their own hands uh, well, not necessarily dirty, but worn out by going to CosmicQuest.org. I run a community that allows people to learn and do science and help NASA scientists who don't have the human resources or the funding to hire the human resources to, well, build maps of the moon, of Mercury, of the asteroid Vesta, and help us understand the geology of these three different worlds and we have new projects coming in the future and we want you to do science as well part of your routine make sure you get in the exercise make sure you get in enough glasses of water and make sure you get in learning and doing science 
Well, very good. Uh, Dr. Gay, thank you very much for being with me today. Uh, everybody watching, remember this episode will be uploaded within about 10, 20 minutes usually. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I really enjoyed having you on. It, it was it was definitely a challenging conversation, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, everyone remember that you can find me on Facebook at uh, Michael Scott Fulford. You can email me at the same address. The uh, Science and Curiosity does have a Facebook page, so make sure to check it out. I'll be posting links there uh, throughout the day. And that should be it for today. Thank you very much, and uh, Pamela, have a great day. Thank you very much.